So one is, uh, uh, so I want to finish first a few points about uh, single stars. And the first point is uh, I want to convince you uh, what is the uh, mass radius uh, relation of the stars uh, at the main sequence. Yeah? And this will be important to understand what happens if we take away or add mass to, uh, to a star and how, so how stars respond to uh, mass transfer. So, uh, in order, so I'll just do a very simple um, analysis of stellar structure and uh, to analyze uh, the stellar structure you have to uh, use the uh, hydrostatic uh, equilibrium uh, equation and I'm not going to even try to solve it, I will replace it with uh, P over R is equal to G uh, M rho over R squared and I will rearrange it a little bit so I write P over rho is, is of the same order as G M over R uh, and this is a, an equation that uh, is I think quite interesting if you really look at it uh, from the physical point of view because you have the gravity and the description of the gravity on the right hand side and description of the matter of, on the left hand side. And when I see an equation like that, when I, when I see G over R, I just cannot resist to add C squared here and C squared here and make both sides dimensionless because then this is half Rg over R. Uh, and this is essentially the equation of state. Yeah? This is the relation between P and uh, rho in dimensionless units. So this is the uh, uh, dimensionless uh, pressure. So. Uh, well, what that implies is that if we assume that uh, stars, uh, <clears throat> there is no, that at the main sequence the uh, pressure comes mainly from the thermal pressure, then uh, pressure will be something like nkt, and our t over rho c squared will be squared, so this will be k uh, t over m p c squared. Yes, because uh, the density is, uh, is uh, dominated by photons, uh, so uh, rho is n times m p, so we, we have uh, this. So, uh, and this is approximately equal to one half r g over uh, r. Uh, assuming that uh, there is no uh, degenerate matter in the center of the star. And now uh, there comes uh, the important point is that <clears throat> the rate of the nuclear reactions at the center of a star depend very strongly, the nuclear energy generation rate, uh, depend very strongly on temperature. It depends on the temperature in the power, I think, of 13 plus, depending, uh, or, or, or so. So, star, uh, the central temperature is very much determined by the rate of the uh, nuclear uh, reactions, and if we want to squeeze the star even a little bit, the a nuclear uh, energy generation or, uh, is just shooting up like crazy. And that is a mechanism to stabilize the temperature in the center of the stars. So uh, the temperature, logarithm of the temperature in uh, uh, main sequence stars varies from few million when the mass goes from 0.01 solar masses to 
50 solar masses. So over two orders of magnitude of mass, 0.0, no, 0.1, uh, it is uh, varying very slowly. So uh, this is varying very slowly with the mass, and which means that this is also varying very slowly with the mass, which means that for sequence stars, the radius is proportional to mass in the power of one plus epsilon, where epsilon is relatively small. So for many sequence stars, the uh, radius uh, of the stars is proportional to the uh, to the mass uh, of the star in equilibrium. Yeah, we have hydrodynamical equilibrium. And the second thing I wanted uh, to show is uh, are the time scales. Because I didn't, you know, I, I talked about the evolution of the stars, but I didn't mention the issue of uh, the time scales that can be uh, relevant for single and for binary evolution. So we have the uh, following time scales that are uh, at our hand. Uh, there is the nuclear time scale. Thermal or Kevin Helmholtz time scale, dynamical time scale, and uh, these three are uh, available or they uh, apply to single stars. Uh, but when we also have the have a binary, we also have a, have the orbital time scale for uh, <coughs> for the for the binaries. So, uh, what is the order of magnitude of these scales? I think I mentioned the nuclear time scale already, but <coughs> I will uh, repeat that in a moment. So, uh, what uh, let me start? Let me. I think I'll start with the okay with the dynamical time scale. So, the dynamical time scale is defined as a time scale when you uh, <coughs> have a star. And uh, if you are God and you can uh, change the laws of physics and you can turn off pressure suddenly, then uh, the the star uh, will start will not have anything to any force to support it and it will start to collapse. But it's not going to collapse right away. It will collapse like uh, pressureless uh, dust, and so therefore this. Time scale is the uh, solution of this simple equations. You have the, uh, uh, this is the dynamical uh, equation with these initial conditions and uh, the time scale for, no, with the, uh, no, the, the order of magnitude can be found uh, just by looking at this equation that uh, T squared might, must be like GM over R uh, to the third. Uh, and uh, for the sun, this is about 1600 seconds, uh, and it scales uh, uh, like square root, inverse square root of, of the mass, and uh, are still in the three halves uh, power. So for massive stars, uh, where <coughs> no, massive main sequence stars, where, where it's not really important, uh, m over r. Uh, uh, cancels and we have uh, this this scale is essentially proportional to the mass or the or the radius of a of a star and for uh, for giants uh, where the masses are maybe uh, no whatever they are but the radii are about a thousand times larger this uh, time scale um, becomes something can be like a uh, hundred to a thousand times uh, longer than, uh, than that. So this time scale essentially uh, applies to episodes in stellar evolution when, the, when we really can have a physical mechanism to turn off the pressure and, and a mechanism like that is, for example, the supernova explosion or beginning of the supernova explosion when the star starts to collapse and then we have something else happening to, uh, to make it explode or collapse to a, uh, 
to a compact uh, object. Uh, then there is the Kevin Helmholtz scale, uh, and this has quite a lot, a long historical uh, uh, application because uh, uh, for a while, uh, that was a big problem that if you take the approximate value of the total gravitational uh, energy in the sun and you divide it by the solar luminosity, you get a time scale of about 30 million years, which is much shorter than the uh, age of the sun. Uh, but uh, uh, this is the scale on which uh, the sun would radiate all of its uh, radiate away all of its gravitation gravitational energy and because of <clears throat> uh, you know you can easily prove that the thermal content thermal energy in the sun is equal uh, practically equal to to its gravitational energy so this is also <clears throat> uh, uh, the time scale for uh, radiating away the uh, uh, the thermal energy uh, by the sun, and it's also a time scale on which uh, a star is going to reach hydrostatic equilibrium after we disturb it. For example, if we uh, add some more thermal energy to to a star by you know steering it, whatever. Uh, or heating it somehow, then uh, it takes a while for the star to realize, oops, I have, uh, I have had much more uh, energy and I have to deal with it, so uh, it, it, it is the time to reach the new uh, equilibrium state. So uh, that is, uh, uh, for example, if we uh, start dumping energy onto a star but in, in the form of matter, uh, then if we do it very rapidly on the time scale much shorter than that, then the star will not have the time to uh, obtain, uh, to, to be in hydrostatic equilibrium. So this uh, time scale is important for uh, the, um, will be important when we will talk about mass transfers uh, to uh, to or from the stars. You know, this, this also uh, applies to the case when we start removing matter from a star and the star has to readjust its structure to the fact that suddenly, oops, I'm losing some of my outer layers uh, and I have to uh, readjust to this new uh, uncomfortable situation and that's the time scale to, uh, to use. Uh, and uh, finally, we have the uh, nuclear uh, uh, time scale, which is the time scale for converting the mass into energy via nuclear reactions. Uh, so, if we computed it with the entire mass of the of a star, that would be a very very long um, time scale. But only about one percent of uh, hydrogen is converted for the uh, solar, for the case of the solar mass, it's about 10 giga years. And I think I have already mentioned that the time scale, uh, that this time scale scales with the mass uh, as inverse uh, mass squared, more or less. And this is because the luminosity of the, uh, of the stars uh, at the main sequence scales as mass to the third or 3.5 power uh, with uh, so, so uh, the stars increase their luminosity very rapidly when they become uh, more uh, more massive so yeah? f is the the fraction of the that's this one percent uh, with the so you know uh, and uh, so it's this one percent and uh, taking into account the efficiency. Okay, so now I can go back to my binary part and uh, so here we are at 
uh, binary evolution again. Uh, we have talked, uh, <coughs> I, I have talked about the uh, different modes of mass transfer. So uh, I started with conservative mass transfer and uh, with the uh, important law that I will repeat that uh, you know you should remember and always have it in mind considering the uh, mass transfers that if you transfer mass from a more massive companion to a less massive, uh, then uh, the system is going to contract and opposite it's going to uh, to expand. And uh, then I started talking about the non very simple parametrization of the non-conservative mass transfer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> which is the, uh, the one where you assume the uh, angular mass uh, loss, uh, angular momentum mass uh, loss as proportional to J over M. Then we obtain the following uh, formula for the uh, evolution of the orbit, but uh, what I'm going to say today is that that's not a unique parametrization and that's not the uh, only parametrization of this process and I'll show you two other uh, parametrizations uh, and I'm not going to argue that anyone uh, it, that any particular one of them is much better than the others just to uh, I'd like you to realize that this is already this process is uh, complicated enough that we really don't have a single good model of how it happens. So, uh, 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 show you uh, the second one. Uh, uh, so, if we have angular momentum uh, loss from a single star, we can assume that. <clears throat> the uh, amount of angular momentum that is uh, uh, lost as a, as a function of the donor mass is some parameter alpha, the same as we had yesterday, uh, times one minus beta, which is the amount of matter that flows out, times the specific angular momentum in the system, J over mu. And in this case, we'll obtain a slightly different formulation of uh, the angular momentum uh, of, of, the, of the evolution of the orbit. So how to obtain this? I just go quickly through uh, the equations. So, mm, dj over j, which is the important quantity, is alpha 1 minus beta d m1 uh, over mu, and it's alpha 1 minus beta uh, times d m1 over m1 m2 m1 plus m2 and that is equal to 1 minus beta <coughs> uh, d m1 over m2 uh, plus d m1 over m1 and since we don't want to have uh, something like because it's not so easy to integrate we can write that it's alpha 1 minus beta over beta with the minus d m2 over m2 plus beta d m1 over m1 yeah. So we can uh, dm2 and dm1 is connected by the uh, by this parameter beta, which uh, defines the uh, effectiveness of the um, mass uh, mass transfer, and then we also we will use the, uh, 
the definition of J, so this that's dm1 over m1 plus d over m2 minus of d m over m plus a. So we can equate this two and obtain uh, the following. So we'll have <coughs> dm1 over m1 times uh, two times <coughs> alpha one minus beta minus one plus two d and two over n two and we have minus alpha beta minus one d m m equals to d a over a and this can be integrated to give a over a zero equal to uh, and that's m over m zero and then m one over m one zero in power of uh, two alpha one minus beta minus one and m two over m to zero in the power of two one. <clears throat> okay, so uh, th this equation also uh, reduces to the uh, uh, case uh, to the <clears throat> non-conservative case when uh, beta is equal to one when we transfer uh, which corresponds to the conservative case then unity and then we'll have my, the power of minus two here and minus two there uh, so in some <clears throat> modeling of uh, the uh, mass transfers in the uh, uh, in binaries, and this is a modeling of a very important part of the mass transfer that I'll talk about. Uh, you use, people use this, or people use uh, this uh, previous uh, um, uh, car, this parameterization. Uh, and the results will differ slightly, and they will differ uh, will differ more if the amount of mass transferred is larger. For, but for, tip, for 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 small uh, mass transfer amounts, uh, this is uh, not so uh, important. Now, uh, here we assume uh, that uh, the specific angular momentum uh, of the matter that is leaving the system is j over mu, so that the matter is decoupling from the system uh, when it uh, leaves the, the star. So it's not correlating an, anymore with the system at uh, higher mm, uh, at larger radii. But if we uh, if we go back and look at the uh, flow potential, yeah, then we have this things like that. Uh, we have one star here. It's feeling its row slope, transferring mass, but some mass is overflowing and can go over L2. Uh, and if it, if the velocity, if the rate with which the mass is uh, transferred is really low, then uh, the mass will sort of wander around this uh, place. Some of it will cross over to here and will form a ring uh, at uh, a ring and will fly away, will decouple from the system at the uh, radius that corresponds to, uh, to L2. 
Yeah? So if the mass is flowing slowly, it's not going to like leave rapidly with its uh, specific angular, angular momentum corresponding to specific angular momentum of the stars, but specific angular momentum will be larger because it's going to correspond to uh, corrotation and at the radius that is uh, uh, <coughs> uh, the radius of the uh, outer Lagrangian point. Now, if we have that, so for, uh, and that will happen if the mass uh, loss rate from the, from the donor is uh, very, very slow. So if we uh, very slowly increase the radius here and very slowly fill up the uh, the power slope with, with the metal, so the typical velocity of the flowing mass, outflowing mass, is uh, much smaller. And it's it's of the order or smaller than the metal. Uh, so uh, in this case we can uh, parameterize or we can uh, uh, describe the mass loss through uh, L2 uh, in a little bit of a, a different way. Mm, so let me just uh, try to get some space here. So here I'll use a little bit of a different uh, formalism, because I will try to uh, uh, <clears throat> express it as a function of the period, not the uh, orbital separation. So uh, now, um, third times uh, g to two thirds p over two. I in one third. Yes, yes. So, you know, we can rewrite the equation for the um, <coughs> uh, angular momentum as a function of period uh, using the Kepler's law, and it's going to look like that. You know, you, st you start from j equal mu square root of gm. A and you use G M over A to the third is equal to two pi over P squared, uh, and you obtain uh, that. Now, <clears throat> let me. Uh, so, if we have a situation like that, then the specific angular ring will be equal, which this is the <clears throat> will be equal to. Uh, square root of g m uh, a ring yeah so <clears throat> if we want to uh, calculate the rate of angular momentum uh, flow when we have the mass leaving mass from m1 leaving through the ring uh, we want to find again tj over j so dj will be the specific angular momentum J ring times <coughs> uh, M over J. Now this will be J ring times one minus beta D M one over J is equal to Square root, whoops, G M A ring uh, over J one minus beta D M one. Okay. Uh, now J in this case will be J is mu square root over G M. A, so we can insert it here and we have square root of G M A ring divided by G M A, uh, one over mu, uh, then it's 
N one N two N one plus N two, and then we have D N one. Yeah, and uh, now we can introduce a parameter eta that will be a over a, and uh, what we'll have is that angular uh, will be at one half, which comes from that. And then we'll have a little uh, juggling of uh, this, which we have already done before, because this is um, d m1 over m2 plus d m1 over m1 over m1. So this is equal to, I forgot one minus beta here. There is one minus beta here. Oops, oops, oops. One minus beta. That looked too simple to me. Okay. Times one minus beta. So we have one half. One minus beta. The same trick. So this will be minus d n over m two uh, one over beta plus d m1 over m1. Now, uh, if we want to look at the period evolution, we, we can rewrite this dj over j as dj over j equal to dm1 over m1 plus dm2 over m2 minus one third uh, d n over n uh, plus one third d p over p and we equate this to we we see what the uh, angular momentum uh, balance and we'll obtain <coughs> um, yeah, I think I can get rid of p now And we'll obtain the following. Uh, oh, okay, it will be D M one over M one times as d m2 over m2 minus one half one <coughs> plus one third d m over m equals one third d p over p and this can be integrated to give p over p naught is uh, okay uh, m over m not uh, m one over m one zero in the power of uh, three M two over M two zero uh, three minus, minus half one minus beta over beta minus one. Okay. So <clears throat> here is uh, uh, another. Uh, uh, so you know, if you and in general. Uh, no, these three parameterizations of uh, the uh, evolution of the orbit during the 
uh, a, a mass transfer, a stable mass transfer, uh, show you that uh, in general what you have to do if you have uh, some mechanisms over which you lose the angular momentum, you have to find the rate with which you uh, lose the angular momentum from the system or add angular momentum to, to the system and e equate it with the um, uh, with the formula you get for from the from the Kepler's law, or uh, either whether you formulate it in terms of uh, period or uh, <coughs> semi-major axis, uh, and then obtain uh, integrated, and you will obtain the evolution of the uh, period or semi-major axis when uh, you transfer the mass, the evolution of the of the orbit. Uh, now, these three cases uh, describe or parameterize uh, reality, and uh, probably none of them is uh, describing it accurately, uh, because if you have three parameterizations, uh, you cannot say that one of them is good, probably all of them are uh, bad, and all of them have some uh, problems, but they uh, span the uh, range of uh, possibility for uh, what is what will happen with the orbit when uh, a mass transfer is uh, taking place. So they uh, provide the range of possibilities uh, for uh, the mass transfer to uh, uh, and the response of the orbit uh, to the mass transfer. Mm. Now, uh, I've mentioned that this uh, applies to the case when the mass transfers are happening in a stable way. So the mass transfer uh, rate is somehow regulated and uh, that we have a steady flow of mass from uh, one star to, to another. And this is not going to be the case all the time, because we uh, we have also uh, quite often the cases when the mass transfer will not be stable. And here we come to uh, the issue of uh, common envelopes. So uh, when do we encounter the uh, something like uh, the common envelope? When we have a, a system, a binary that fills it uh, uh, row slope and if we uh, start the mass transfer from uh, a poor mass binary to a less massive binary uh, then what will happen is what what's going to happen is that the orbit will tend to shrink uh, in order for the mass transfer to be to be stable the donor will have to shrink uh, at the rate uh, that would be faster than the shrinking of the orbit and uh, uh, the decrease of the uh, row slope uh, radius and in many cases, uh, the response of the donor is actually opposite. If the don donor has uh, a convecting envelope, uh, it will happily expand when you remove some mass from it. So not only will the system shrink, but the donor is going to expand and overfill its row slope even more. So this is a runaway situation, and the runaway uh, will happen on uh, a mix of orbital and uh, time scales and the time scale for uh, the uh, donor to expand its envelope, which is uh, 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 close to the to, to the Helmholtz uh, time scale. But uh, the more more important is uh, that the uh, orbit is going to be shrinking. Uh, on the time scale that is determined by the <coughs> mass uh, uh, transfer rate, yeah? because this is how the uh, uh, what, what 
affect the shrinkage of the uh, of the orbit. So uh, that is uh, an unstable situation. You start uh, transferring mass, and when you start transferring mass, you find yourself in a situation when you are uh, forced to transfer even more mass, and the orbit starts to shrink, and when you start to transfer even more mass, the orbit starts to shrink even more, uh, which is a runaway uh, situation. So, uh, what happens in such a case? So, you have a donor, now some, some big star, some smaller star, which is an acceptor. Uh, they move towards another, the envelope expands, and inevitably, the, this star, the acceptor, will fall into the envelope uh, of, the, of the donor. Yeah? So, uh, this will uh, happen on a very short time scale, and uh, this will lead to, uh, you know, the, the, then the question happens with the system in, some, in, a, in a case like that. So, in order to really find the answer, we would have to run, uh, well, design uh, a good uh, hydrodynamical simulation when we take into account the uh, motion of this star, the envelope of that star, the influence of the energy generated by the friction of this star in the envelope of that star, the influence of the uh, energy radiated with the nuclear reaction of that, this star, uh, inside the star, the star will get an, an additional source of energy in, in its uh, envelope. Uh, and uh, it's a, a quite complicated process. And when we have uh, complicated processes in binary evolutions, we try to simplify them. And I think that's a general statement in physics that if you have something very complicated, you try to parameterize it and then uh, get a physical feel of what will happen. So, uh, there are um, two major uh, phenomenological descriptions of this process. One uh, uh, comes from Webbing in 1984, uh, and another, another is by paczynski Joukowski in 67, that was uh, revived in 2005 by Nelemans and Taft. Uh, and, and I showed you the, the two uh, formalisms in the in this moment. So, the webbing formalism assumes the following. Uh, suppose that this star has a compact core and an expanded uh, envelope. Uh, this system, this star, comes in and dumps energy into the envelope. Uh, the energy that it uh, dumps is mainly coming from the orbital energy of this uh, of this object because once you know uh, the, the, since the time scale for this um, event is relatively short you you do not expect that a lot of mass will be transferred will be accepted by the uh, by the donor, because uh, it just doesn't have the time. Even if it accepts the matter at the Eddington rate, it's, it's not going to be a lot, of, a lot of matter. And do you know what the Eddington rate is, or? Yeah. Okay. If somebody doesn't, please ask me. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what we do is then, we compare the we do the energy balance. Uh, we have the uh, initial and final orbital energy of uh, the uh, of, of the system, uh, and this orbital energy will be used uh, uh, to do the work, expel the envelope to throw away. Uh, of this this star, yeah. So, um, 
uh, we assume something like that, that we have some uh, this is the uh, amount of energy that is uh, uh, being orbital energy uh, that is being uh, the reservoir of orbital energy that we have in the system that's the difference between the final and the initial uh, energy, but there is some efficiency with which this energy is transferred to the uh, uh, to to the the donor, and uh, we uh, parameterize this. Uh, energy that well then if it's transferred to the to the donor it will be used towards expelling uh, the envelope so it has to be uh, compared with the binding energy of the envelope to the core of the uh, the donor so uh, the, the, this is the uh, basic uh, <coughs> A setup alpha uh, is the efficiency with which we transfer the energy to the uh, envelope, and lambda is another parameter which uh, describes how uh, what is the binding energy of uh, of the uh, of the envelope. So, what is the envelope structure uh, of the of the donor? So then we have the we have the following equation. Uh, okay, we have alpha C E and then the final energy is uh, minus G M one final times M two over two a final minus minus so it's plus g uh, m1 initial m2 over a i initial and uh, the binding energy of the uh, uh, of the of the donor is g uh, times the mass of the core times mass of the envelope divided by lambda which describes the structure of the uh, envelope of the donor times uh, the radius of this uh, star and the radius is the initial uh, or is the ra radius of the Roche lobe because that's the radius of the star yeah? So it's minus G M one final M one M one envelope divided by lambda I R L. Okay, and then when we, you can uh, solve it, uh, so uh, let me maybe do it. Uh, quickly and discuss it in a short way. <coughs> so minus alpha C E. Uh, okay, no minus. Mm. 
Just RL. Uh, well, eight. This is the. Oh, I, I, I made a confusing. So uh, that's a con con rows of uh, radius. Uh, I, I, I did. I wrote it before as L of Q, but this is the same as RL. I should uh, change it to XL to be uh, <coughs> to be. Uh, correct. Okay, so this we can switch to plus plus plus, and we can have uh, uh, a i over a f, and we'll divide it. So we have to divide it by m one f m two, so that m one This is should be one. Hmm. Hmm. M one F. I think I have some uh, index problems in the last formula. Uh, F divided by uh, M one F M two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this cancels out. That's strange. Uh, okay, so we have, uh, let me write it together here, the result, which I, th I think I confused something. So, uh, AF over AI would be equal to M1 initial over M1 final. Plus an uh, envelope over uh, alpha lambda L, L of Q uh, M two to minus one. Uh, that really leaves me a little bit confused, but uh, let me see. So uh, let's uh, try to estimate the. Uh, you know what that means in in terms of a real system. So uh, suppose that we have uh, mm, 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 should be M one F here, and that, so uh, suppose that we have uh, the following situation: that we have a giant donor with the mass. M1i of n solar masses it has a core of two solar masses, and uh, it comes into uh, contact with M2 of about one, maybe one, one solar mass. Yeah, so like neutron star. So we have a giant and a neutron star, and they come into a 
uh, common envelope. Let's try to estimate what what would this be. So uh, we have here is m one i. It's ten divided by m two one f by two. The envelope mass is eight. Uh, let's assume that alpha lambda is about uh, unity. Uh, are uh, the Rauschlaub uh, factor will be something like uh, 0.5, uh, and M2 is about 1 uh, to minus 1, so we have uh, 5 plus <coughs> uh, 16 to minus 1, so this is uh, 21, 1, 21. Yeah? Uh, so, uh, in this case, uh, we bring the orbit by a factor of 20. Yeah? So, what is really happening with common envelopes that uh, in this formalism, we uh, take the two, two stars, we uh, eject the uh, envelope, and we shrink the system uh, by a lot. And, uh, you know, the second thing to, to realize is that although uh, there are two parameters here, it's an essentially one parameter because they come as a, as a product. So uh, alpha and lambda are uh, just one thing that we have to assume. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the second thing is, uh, the next thing is that alpha, the common envelope efficiency, can be higher than one, which uh, would, uh, you know, on the, on the first look contradict the energy conservation uh, law, but uh, if we have additional energy sources, like uh, nuclear energy coming from the acceptor or accretion energy from uh, matter that falls onto the uh, uh, acceptor in the common envelope, then uh, we can have uh, alpha greater than, uh, than, th than unity. Uh, and, uh, but we also can have very low uh, efficiency if we have uh, if uh, this uh, becomes low, then this becomes high and the orbit has to uh, by uh, so uh, common envelope is a mechanism to uh, shrink uh, the orbit and to make a compact uh, binary with uh, you know, wow, you know, the, the acceptor, whatever it is, and uh, the core uh, of the donor. And it is a, an essential uh, part of uh, any uh, scenario uh, to form compact object uh, uh, binaries uh, with the, with the uh, binary uh, evolution. One thing to be cautious that in order for common envelope to work, we have to, and it will, I mean, it will always work, but the results will be uh, different. So uh, the possible outcomes of a common envelope doesn't have to be uh, still a binary. If there is not enough uh, binding uh, energy in the envelope, then the system will continue shrinking, and uh, what we'll have, we'll have a merger of the core uh, of the donor is the acceptor. And if the acceptor is a compact object, like a neutron star or a black hole, will uh, end up having a very uh, unusual object, which will be a star with a neutron star or a black hole in the center, which are called, are called torn Zhitkov objects, and the star will be uh, supported by uh, mainly by the accretion of matter onto the neutron star or onto the black hole in the center, uh, which will s surpass in luminosity the nuclear reactions in the in the core, and this will be a short-lived object, relatively short-lived object. Uh, and I think that such objects must exist. Haven't seen them, 
but uh, the existence of such objects is inevitable. Uh, I don't know what would be the observational signatures to, to, to see something like that, uh, apart from uh, seeing a common envelope uh, and uh, having a common envelope end up uh, with a single, uh, single object. Uh, but the second thing that we have not seen yet, uh, we, uh, and the reasons are quite uh, obvious, these uh, events uh, are very, taking very short time, so looking at uh, a chance of uh, spotting something like that is uh, extremely difficult. And uh, we, but on the other hand, we know that there exist objects such as X-ray binaries, uh, such as uh, double neutron stars, and these objects, the two, two neutron stars are close to one another, uh, much closer than the radii, the sizes of the stars that they originated from. So there must have been a mechanism that brought them together, and the uh, only mechanism in binary evolution is uh, to uh, to use uh, the common envelope. Uh, there, there, there are some uh, other uh, theories, but they, they are you know, based on uh, extremely, I think, uh, rare and uh, unusual assumptions, so they cannot, in my opinion, explain all the phenomenology of the binary stars that uh, we have. So, uh, what does it take to succeed? And by succeed, I mean to form a tight binary in a common envelope. Uh, we need to, the, the donor star has to have a clear core and envelope structure. So it has to be evolved and it has to have this two component structure so that uh, if the incoming uh, acceptor uh, starts, uh, you know, mixing and uh, the envelope and injecting energy into the envelope. Uh, the envelope can go, but the core has to stay. And in, in order for the core to stay, it has to be clearly there has to be a clear definition, clear boundary between the core and uh, and uh, the envelope uh, and. What are the unknowns? I think I try, I try to think about the most important uh, unknowns. One is the envelope structure. We know that the envelope structure will differ from one star to another and will depend on the evolutionary uh, stage of the star, on its mass, on its history, on the metallicity, on the uh, properties of that star. So uh, that will be fed uh, into calculation of uh, the lambda coefficient, and there are calculations that show that lambda is not a universal uh, constant, but it's rather a function of uh, the structure of the uh, star. Then, uh, you know, we have to really, we, we don't really know what is the energy injection mechanism, how you, you send in a, a star into the envelope of another star. Uh, it's like, you know, mixing a pot with a soup. Uh, and you uh, you inject some energy. How it is? How effectively you can uh, uh, transfer the energy? And you know th this is extremely complicated hydrodynamics. So uh, it's not uh, easy to, to say. Then there is a question on the time scale and estimates of the time scale for the common envelope uh, vary from months to ten years. Uh, all of these time scales are slow, uh, are very short on the stellar compared to other stellar time scales. Uh, but and then they, and they mean that this is not going to be uh, easily um, observable. Uh, but uh, we don't really know what the uh, what the, what the time scale is. And the third thing is that if you you know. There will be another time scale if you expel the envelope from, from a system like that. Then you send out uh, quite a lot, like in, in example here, eight solar masses of matter. 
out around the binary, and this matter is not going to disappear like that. It will stay there for a while, and it's going to uh, radiate uh, IR. Uh, so this, will, this should be accompanied by uh, an infrared outburst that should be quite bright and long-lasting, and something like that should be observable. So, so there are uh, surveys for infrared outbursts in uh, the galaxy, because if you see something that uh, is uh, red, just like with, uh, uh, with gravitational wave bursts, you, and you want to see it, you have to observe a lot of galaxies, and then you have some chances to then there's the question of the influence on the acceptor, whether the acceptor that is being sent in, whether it can uh, accrete some matter or not. So one argument is that if the time scale is months to 10 years, then uh, the amount of matter that can be accreted at the Eddington rate uh, is uh, really minuscule and you will not uh, increase the mass of the acceptor by uh, any and a factor, but there are some people who say, and they are quite right, that uh, the Eddington limit applies to uh, optically thin accretion. Uh, if you have optically thick accretion, then uh, you can uh, send in as much matter as, uh, as, you, as you like. Like if you send uh, a stone towards the Earth, yeah, a stone is not uh, optically thin, and the radiation pressure is only uh, working on the surface on, of the stone, but the gravity is coming from the entire uh, volume uh, of the stone. So uh, if you send a, a star into an envelope of another star, you can probably accrete at, uh, at a rate that is much higher than Eddington, and then if this is true, you may increase uh, or change the mass uh, of the uh, acceptor by a significant amount and maybe transfer uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 uh, or half as mass as some people say uh, to, to this object. So this is uh, still not known, this is still an open, uh, open uh, question. So to make uh, the, the picture uh, complete, uh, I will tell you that uh, the description which I have shown, which is the most widely used, and it's believed to be much closer to the to, to the truth, to the true uh, truth, what is happening in the in these uh, binaries is not the only description. So there is this alternative treatment of the common envelope, and that just shows you that if you have something uh, to parameterize, there are many ways to parameterize it, and you can uh, try to uh, try to do it. So that's this uh, formalism from originally from '67. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, you don't really look at the energy balance, you look at the angular momentum balance, and uh, you, ask, you look what is the amount of angular momentum that is removed from the system, uh, and uh, you parameterize it by a parameter gamma, so alpha and lambda is already taken, so we have to use another name. And, <clears throat> and the amount of uh, angular momentum that is taken to, from the system is proportional to uh, gamma times the uh, amount of matter that is expelled the, from, from, from the system. And from that, uh, uh, and from the uh, definition of the uh, angular momentum, uh, you can obtain uh, this, uh, this formula, uh, which uh, can easily be uh, erased. <laughs> Would you realize that? Okay, uh, J is M1, M2, M1, third, uh, G2, two, two thirds. Uh, P over 2 pi in one 
curve, and uh, you take this top equation, so you have Jf is equal to Ji1 minus gamma m over m total. Uh, and uh, put in uh, all of this, then you have uh, m1 f m2 f over m f one third. Uh, we can skip this. P f to one third is equal to m1 i m2 i over m i to one third and p i to one p i p i to one third one minus gamma v m over m and from this you get uh, P F over P I is equal to uh, M F over M I. Then we have the uh, M I over M one F to the third M to F over M I. Third, uh, uh, and one minus gamma d n over n to the third. So this the, is the way to, to derive it. And this formula uh, has been used to explain the properties of high dwarf binaries. And uh, there are people, people claim that uh, this is uh, much better for uh, the, <coughs> the binaries uh, in some cases, but I think that this uh, this can be. So uh, now, what you know, when we start transferring mass from one uh, star to another, uh, we'll uh, need to uh, consider the influence of the mass transfer uh, on the stars. And what uh, uh, happens when we uh, transfer some mass uh, on the stars is that there are you know, several uh, things. The first uh, thing that I uh, find uh, kind of uh, funny is the so-called uh, rejuvenation, because when you uh, have a star on the main sequence with some age, and you transfer uh, a significant amount of mass on the on the star, then it becomes a star. Uh, the uh, the evolutionary age uh, that corresponds to the to its initial state, but a higher mass. And a higher mass star uh, would have uh, evolved much quicker. But so it's higher mass, but it is still uh, it's its age is corresponding to, to its uh, lower mass. So for an external observer, it looks like a higher mass star, but much younger than the initial uh, star that uh, it started from. So that uh, means that it has been rejuvenated. It's younger than uh, it should be. So uh, in stellar evolution, if you uh, add mass to an object, uh, it looks younger <laughs> than uh, uh, the object that would not accrete too much mass <laughs> over its uh, over its uh, lifetime. So this is uh, one effect that the, this is this rejuvenation. Uh, another is that when you uh, put uh, mass or mass on, uh, on on a star, uh, you get some additional energy into the star, so uh, there is accretion and the brightness of the star 
uh, increases and this can uh, affect the uh, evolutionary stage of that uh, star. When you transfer mass, you can also transfer angular momentum and add uh, rotation uh, to that star, so you can uh, spin up a star or spin up the envelope of the star in relation to the uh, to the core. Uh, so you may have differential rotation, and unless you have strong magnetic fields, there may be not enough coupling to make the uh, star uh, rotate rigidly, so the core may be rotating slowly, the envelope may be rotating uh, faster, so you, you can introduce uh, some uh, variation in the uh, rotational velocity uh, of a star. And of course, you, uh, uh, in, if, you, if you dump uh, uh, the matter with uh, a different chemical composition than the original composition of the star, you change the chemical composition and uh, you change the uh, future uh, evolution of the star because it will start suddenly have, it may have uh, more hydrogen now than, than it used to have. Uh, you can dump, you know, hydrogen, uh, on a star that didn't have hydrogen uh, already, or you can uh, dump some material that is really uh, chemically, chemically evolved onto a chemically unevolved uh, star. Uh, so there are all of these uh, effects, and uh, there is also a question of the radii, because when you start dumping matter onto a star, uh, you will uh, most likely uh, move the star out of the uh, thermo, well, hydrodynamical equilibrium, so its radius can expand or uh, it can shrink depending on what is the uh, what is the uh, equation of state or of the of the envelope. Uh, and uh, usually, so if you dump matter on a time scale that is shorter than the uh, Kelvin Helm Helmholtz time scale, you will have uh, uh, you will put the star uh, out of uh, equilibrium, and it's not going to uh, to be uh, to be uh, no, it, it will be it will be uh, disturbed. So now. In the six minutes that I have left today, I'll start uh, moving. So, uh, so I think that this uh, concludes uh, the part that I wanted to talk about mass transfers as uh, individual processes, and I'll uh, return to uh, when talking about the evolution of binaries and talking when uh, various mass transfers take place they appear, but I think that, uh, you know, I still have uh, two more uh, building blocks that I'd like to add to your collection of building blocks for uh, the, uh, mm, for, for, for the binary evolution, and these are the building, so these processes, apart from the uh, common envelopes, were really uh, slow processes. Common envelopes are already fast processes, but there are two more fast processes that I want to talk about. One is the Darwin instability, and I try to, uh, and another are supernova explosions. So I'll start with Darwin instability. Maybe I'll uh, just sketch the uh, idea uh, uh, today and finish it uh, uh, tomorrow. So, uh, you have a star, uh, and, uh, uh, say, uh, a giant or a, uh, a, a, this, an, another star that is here. Uh, before it uh, gets into the contact, uh, you may recall, you may think that, uh, you know, there is this star and there is this big star, so there should be very uh, efficient tidal forces working here. 
Yeah? So if the tidal forces are working here, uh, we have already learned that the system will want to uh, rotate as a rigid body. So they, the, the, the orbits, the, the orbit and the rotational period of this uh, star will want to synchronize. So how, how will that work in, uh, in detail? We, if we had the synchronization, then the total uh, angular momentum of the system is conserved. So if we want to synchronize the rotation of the star with the orbital motion of uh, that star, then we transfer the angular momentum, orbital angular momentum of the star to the rotational angular momentum of that star. But uh, this is not going to uh, leave this star uh, in the same place. It's going to change its orbit. Yeah? If it changes its orbit, it will change the orbital separation, but it will also change its uh, orbital period, orbital frequency. So there will be some d omega orbit and d omega rotation. Now the question to you is, uh, if uh, which one sh should, should, should be uh, larger? If we have, uh, you know, so, uh, if d omega rotation is larger, this is the, then d omega orbital, then this is a stable situation. Right? Because we change the uh, orbital period only slightly, and the rotational period of the star is adjusting to it very quickly. Yeah? But what if the omega orbital is larger than the omega rotation? We want to transfer some angular momentum from uh, the orbit to the star. Uh, we transfer some of it, but the omega orbital changes by a larger amount than we wanted to uh, transfer in the first place, and uh, the system becomes uh, unstable. Yeah? Then the, uh, we want to transfer even more of the uh, orbital uh, angular momentum, uh, but the, we, when doing it, we only move the orbital, uh, with the, the rotational uh, speed by uh, a little bit, and in the end, uh, this, uh, the, you know, when we transfer the orbital angular momentum to the rotational angular momentum, that means that the, the system will uh, will be uh, that this will be. Uh, mm, uh, falling towards that star, and if we have an instability like, like that, then we will have a merger, or we'll start uh, the uh, mass transfer, uh, and that may lead to uh, to, the, to, to a common envelope uh, uh, mass transfer, uh, and this will be driven by the angular momentum uh, transfer from the orbit to the uh, rotation of the star. And it can be shown that uh, the stability uh, condition for that is that the, 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 the system has to be uh, can be, will be stable if the orbital angular momentum is larger, one third of the orbital or angular momentum is larger than, larger than the uh, uh, rotational angular momentum, and uh, I will show why that is tomorrow. <laughs>